and I'm from Canada. That's easy for you, more difficult for me. I'm <laughs> Eliza Pentinen, and I'm Polish, living in Finland permanently at the moment because of my Finnish husband. Okay. Nice. Ah, I'm 52. Yay! Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work as a lawyer, um, but I guess you could say I'm retired from that profession. Yeah, my profession. So what I was studying is was horticulture, but at the moment I'm taking care of my first husband. So my first high altitude climb was Lobuche East uh, in 2010. And now it's 2016, and this is my 15th high altitude expedition, um, and my eighth or ninth 8,000 meter. <laughs> and for me, I climbed, I think, Kilimanjaro in 2005, and then I thought that, oh, this is such a great adventure to climb. And uh, I started to climb a little bit in uh, the Alps and uh, also in Ecuador to time with all the volcanoes. To Himalaya in 2011 when we met together and this expedition is my sixth uh, Himalaya expedition. Both joined the same company okay. and we were the only two girls on oh, the yeah. team That's right. and yeah. we just got along really well and yeah. became really good friends on that expedition yeah. Like, and that's a friendship that's lasted through the years whether yeah. we've climbed together or not. Or not. Yeah. Yes. I feel like mountaineering has a little bit of a macho reputation. <laughs> Do you feel like that's true? And what's it like to be a female in, in this type of area? I don't know what to talk about, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It, it always used to be an, on an expedition, especially, you know, maybe seven or 8,000 meters high, you would only have one, maybe two girls. Mm. Now, like on this one, we have four, four of us. I think high altitude mountaineering is a great equalizer of the sexes. But sometimes it takes the men some time to realize that. Yesterday we were practicing and we were like, okay Didi, try try to, to do this. So they were like expecting you not to do this because you are Didi. Didi means a sister, which means like a woman. Okay. Yeah, maybe um, some of them, but some of them also know. But then they change their mind when they see uh, Grace running through the letters. <laughs> they say like, very strong, very strong. <laughs> you know, at sea level, there's an expectation that if you're even hiking somewhere that as a young man or a man that's fit, you will always be stronger than the strongest woman. And that, I think, can take over uh, a lot of men's behavior. And, and it's, it's not, it's, I think it's just subconscious. It's not like I want to beat this person. It's no. at sea level, I should totally be ahead of this person. Mm. And I've been on climbs where, you know, a big guy has turned around and been like, how are you climbing so fast? Like you have these little legs and yeah. it's like, and I've got these huge legs, and how is it possible? Yeah. So I think that, sure, everybody brings their sea level attitudes and expectations okay. maybe with them, but after you spend a little time up here, um, either we quickly become viewed as one of the boys, or it just, everything, everyone just kind of becomes human beings. Yeah. So this is our technically second attempt. We were on the north side of Everest in Tibet in 2015, um, and we had made it to high camp, Sorry, advanced base camp. That's 6,500 meters. Oh, six, six. Um, then the earthquake hit as we were coming down. So oh, no. an advanced base camp is just a hike. So there's no climbing yes. yet. So we're not quite sure whether this is our first Everest attempt or not. It's no, the second time we've attempt. showed up forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and we've both actually climbed Lhotse, which is there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we've been up most of this side of the mountain, okay. but I mean mountains change every year, so it won't even be the same as when we were going up. Let's say so. That was 2012. And, and why? Me and why are we here on the mountain? Why Everest? Um, my answer. Um, eventually, I knew I would want to do it. Who wouldn't want to stand on top of the highest mountain in the world? It was never my primary focus. It was the first mountain that ever made me come to the Himalayas because I just wanted to see it. And I'd seen it in National Geographic and thought this would be cool. As a result, I ended up climbing Lobuche East and falling in love <laughs> with big mountains. And maybe this is like a full circle kind of thing. 
that it started like last year we wanted to go for Everest because I thought that it's a very safe mountain mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. from all of the mountains. No, this is because there are fixed ropes and um, yeah, and she also... because of the fixed ropes. And I thought I have to come back home. <laughs> she, and she thought it would be her last climb. And, yeah, yeah, more or less like it, that will be my last climb. And so the safeness of the climb, yeah, of the, of, of the mountain. You know, I mean, to have the chance to climb with someone that you know mm -hmm. is a really special thing. So, yeah, so I kind of is... called her up to say, I'm going to this side. Probably. You Best of luck with your plan. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, why not? Okay, I'm coming too, right? Yeah, and yeah. it was again because of the friends. Mm -hmm. Because she's here and Arnold is here. I've been really lucky to, be, to climb <clears throat> fairly steadily over the last six years. So when I first started climbing, I put a lot more focus into specific training, making sure my cardiovascular system was up to par. Running, uh, endurance type stuff, doing things that are, are really uncomfortable, that make you want to quit, and then forcing yourself to do it for like another hour so that your mind gets strong. I think that's a great way. Whatever it is that you want to quit, just make yourself keep doing it. Then you'll get the mental strength. And you need strength. I think strength is underestimated. You don't need too much muscle, but you need enough muscle to carry um, heavy things. So you mentioned about mental strength. Um, Polish people usually say that climbing the mountains, high mountains, is like 20% is physical effort and 80% is mental effort. So <laughs> I really still hope it's like that. <laughs> because my training was very limited. Uh, and the reason was my husband, my sick husband, and I couldn't leave uh, home. Um, I can't leave him home at home at, alone at all. I think also, like that, that our uh, best preparation is like uh, uh, being many times on uh, on the on the expeditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like from every year, I think we are better. Although it doesn't mean that we train more. Yeah. Been hiking yeah. preparation to our base camp. You can see the people who like coming only for hiking and they start to race yeah. between each other, whereas we take it really easy and we walk very slowly. And some people then tell us that, oh, you are so slow. And it's like, okay, let's gonna see later on how you feel up there and how we feel up there. And that, but that's that that is that means experience, right? That we know that yeah. it requires long. Uh, and slow uh, movement on the on yeah. the mount mountain. So uh, you know, most people fly into Kathmandu, and uh, on this side of the mountain, the south side, we'll spend uh, a week to ten days trekking in. That's the normal uh, path to here. And they get here. Normally, you'll rest for a few days. By the time you get here, your Sherpas and your logistics company have set everything up. Um, you chill out for a few days. You have to wait for the kumbu ice wall to be fixed with rope, so that can sometimes cause delays. You also have to wait for rope to be fixed from camp one to camp two. Yeah. Once that's done, um, some people go to another peak first, 6,000 meters, to do some acclimatization. If they do that, then they don't have to go through that as many times. Um, so then what they would do is go up to camp one, probably sleep a night, head to camp two and spend a bunch of nights there. That's what we're gonna be doing, maybe a week in camp two. We'll see. While we're there, we're going to do some acclimatization runs up to Camp 3. Some people may sleep up there. Uh, it's kind of a personal choice. There's really no scientific proof as to one being better than the other. <clears throat> so we'll all make that choice. And then once we're done that, we'll all come down here and then we wait for a weather window because that's kind of the end of our acclimatization. Some teams might do a couple, uh, one more run through. And we're done and we're waiting for a great weather window, which for us, we suspect will come mid to late May, but you never know. We'll just keep an eye on the weather. We spent a lot of time down here. A lot of us may choose to go down to a lower village so we can feel good, acclimatize better, and then come back up fresh for a summit push. And then you go base camp, camp two, camp two's at six four, camp three's at seven three, sleep a night at each of these camps. Then you go camp four at 8,000 meters. You don't really sleep, you just rest for a while. And then ideally you get up and head for the summit and hopefully come all the way back down to camp two, have a nice night's sleep and come back through there for the last time.
which means six days probably or <laughs> something. It's not one wow. day to the yeah. summit, Some right? people might spend two nights at Cape 2 before moving oh, out. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 But that's the general. Yeah. Oh, okay. to it. If everything okay. goes perfectly to schedule, that's how it's yeah. going to work, which never happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, which one should I do? Yeah, okay. Lotte, back there. Um, and this happens. And for all of you who think this doesn't happen, you're just lying. <laughs> I came down from the summit of Lotte and uh, was in, got into the tent in Camp 4 and I had left two bottles there. They were both the same bottles. One was pee. And one was 10. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure I had tape on one of them, but you have to understand how severely dehydrated you are and how exhausted you are. And so I got into the tent and I just grabbed a bottle. Background though, your pee is pretty much water up there. <laughs> <laughs> Opened up my pee bottle, started guzzling it. And then I brought it down. <laughs> it didn't taste weird. That was the funny thing. But I realized as I looked at the other bottle that I may have made a mistake. And then I realized <laughs> I had made a mistake. And I just started laughing. And my the girl I was climbing with came into the tent at that moment. I'm sitting there laughing. And she's like, well, what did you do? I'm like, I just drank my pee. <laughs> you know what? I would do it again. <laughs> Good story.